Hey, Charlie. Welcome to Talk Python to Me. Hi, Michael. Great to have you here. We have corresponded back and forth about security things. And now, are you here to scare us? Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> Uh, it's it's going to seem that way. There are threats everywhere when you, especially when you start looking, and that's that's the problem. You look, you'll find them. If you're if you're not looking, you might you might get um, uh, affected without even knowing it. Yeah, but that's true. But we're also going to come with some tools and techniques and tips on how to avoid security problems with your Python code. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's an especially I don't know, concerning, that certainly catches my attention, that if you mess with somebody's software, like the software builders, the developers, it gets shipped to however many users are on the other side of that equation, right? It's not like I just took over some teenager's gaming PC and now what can I do? It's like I took over, you know, name your big, big web app and now we're going to start shipping some stuff around. Yes. All right. That that's where, where the sort of multiplicative aspect of this gets more concerning than just standard personal computer safety, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, a single developer can can have very broad impacts. With you know, maybe they publish one package, but that one package mm -hmm. could be included in hundreds, thousands of other packages as a dependency, and then everyone using those those packages could could be affected whether the code is is good and works as intended or poorly written <laughs> and has bugs and vulnerabilities yeah well, it, this, is, this is this <laughs> is not to say there's any chance of there being a problem with pydantic but just to make your point you if you go to like pydantic or request or something like that a lot of these have used by projects right and this pydantic is used by 315,000 people uh pro not people software projects that then yeah. themselves have users right and so it's that's the kind of stuff that i'm thinking about when i said that multiplicative effect right it's it's a big multiplier not just a, a couple oh yeah yeah for sure yeah now before we dive into our main topic of course you know tell people a bit about yourself hi well my name is charles coggins uh, i usually go by charlie and I, I, I'm a Python developer. I'm a software developer, but not through the traditional sense. I don't have a computer science degree. I didn't um, come to this, you know, straight out of school. Mm -hmm. I, I got my first uh, taste of programming long enough ago, back in the '80s, in 1987. My dad got a computer for us, and um, you know, I was messing around on there with, with, uh, with some games. Always with games, right? You know. Mm -hmm. when, um, at the time, it was basic. You know, it was this bowling game that my brother and I would play, and I saw that I could I could look at the code, I could look at the source, and I went in there and modified it a bit to make it so that I would always win <laughs> whenever I played him. <laughs> um, but how then, long did it take him to catch on? Oh, he figured out pretty pretty quickly, and he was in there too, changing you know ball speed <laughs> and and uh, you know how often he could get a gutter or, or make mm -hmm. get a gutter. Um, but yeah, I you know, took, took a class or two in high school and college, but I, um, I was an uh, electrical engineering major and then, uh, went to work for the government, um, doing something that wasn't even really that. So, <laughs> uh, I, I spent 10 years working for the government before they, um, stood up the U S cyber command and decided or figured out that, uh, they needed to hire, 6,000 new developers to, to fill the positions. And there weren't that many available in the industry, let alone those who could, you know, pass the clearances and, and work in that environment. So they looked to people already working in the government. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand. I said, yes, yes, I want to cross train. <laughs> uh, I'll be a developer. And so uh, they trained Excellent. me. What did they teach you for language in that program? Uh, we we um, started with C, C++, and then mm -hmm. uh, there was some Python. So I went through a couple of boot camps and a lot of self-learning, self-teaching. Python's doing... the one that really clicked for me. It just made yeah. sense in my head. <laughs> yeah, of course. If you're learning to do cybersecurity stuff, you know, a lot of times I'd be happy to tell people like, ah, you don't really need to learn C or Rust or Java, 
just if you just know Python, you're you're probably ninety eight percent of the time golden. But if you're trying to do cybersecurity, a lot of times it's about like the machine level stuff, right? Understanding things like C and pointers and buffer overflows and yeah, all of that kind of stuff is where you actually kind of need to be, right? And they and they taught us all that as well. In fact, we we learned assembly language as well, and and that one really didn't fit in my brain so <laughs> you're not like i'd want to become an assembly language language programmer i mean they're yeah that's that's a that's a whole different breed <laughs> yeah it sure is and you know it used to be i remember when i first got into programming i was doing some C C plus plus and inline assembly was something people would do a lot to optimize a lot like uh people might do cython or number or something like that right. to make Python fast. Like we'll find this little part and we'll rewrite it in this way and be like, we're just going to do inline assembly. I'm like, that just doesn't seem like <laughs> <laughs> worthwhile. I, I don't need that much performance. We're going to not do that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Fun. So now you're working at Phylum. Uh, Python. Uh, is it Python focused or just software uh, security? It, it's it's not Python focused. In fact, the uh, the company primarily develops with Rust, uh, as you oh, as you were mentioning. Okay. But, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We've got we've got some excellent Rust developers uh, at our at our company, and I think that's what it's attracted a lot of them is is that um, that is the primary language we use. But we also have some elements in Python, and and when I came on board. Uh, I got assigned to work on our integrations, um, you know, so like GitHub uh, app, app, uh, integrations, GitLab, pre-commit hooks, things like that. And mm -hmm. so I was able to kind of architect it the way I, I, I thought best. And because and I love Python, I, I made mm -hmm. it all in Python and, you know, um, exposed it to Excellent. Docker containers. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Are you doing... Are you doing direct integration with Rust, like Pi O3, or are you? Is it more? No, the 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 commands out. The Rust elements that our our company works on, like so, our API, um, the command line interface, um, a lot of the back end, it's just written straight Rust, and then okay. the the Python is just just plain Python. There's there's no um, interface between the two, really. Um, yeah. Okay. Consuming APIs and Docker containers and stuff like that. Right, right, right. Although I'm, I'm, I am interested in the PyO three, and I think I, I would, you know, there's, there's room to um, bridge the two languages at our company. <laughs> well, I mean, for sure, people are adopting Rust for the performance foundations of Python. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I, I, you know, I've been at the company almost two years now. I keep, I keep. I keep saying it's it's what I'm going to learn next is Rust and <laughs> and I felt like I would just kind of absorb it by going through code reviews and, and my and mm -hmm. people on my team. It mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet, you know. I can I can kind of understand what's going on by reading it, but I I just yeah I need to jump in. F in def. Really. Okay, got it. Those those are the same. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. Okay, well we're not here to talk about Rust, although I do think it's becoming one of those things that is sort of. Kind of, the, if you need to be a little one level deeper in the Python space, that used to be C, and now it's. I think it's pretty solidly moving to be Rust, right? It's there's a lot of popular things, pedantic, for example, I pulled up earlier, where that's the foundation, but that also seems to be where the momentum is. Yeah, the oxidation of of, of Python <laughs> libraries is, is, right. is a real thing. I mean, you know, look at Rough, right? <laughs> yeah, Rough. I just heard about. How, Granium, I think it was, which is a, a new similar similar to G Unicorn and MicroWiski is a Rust based async server. You know, there's it goes on and on. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's talk about software security though. You know, like we touched on it a little bit with the multiplicative aspect of like why software developers should care, but maybe let's start with some some ways in which viruses might get on your computer from a software perspective not I mean, not from like oh you know i found this cool app on BitTorrent, and normally it's paid but this one's free it's like mm, maybe don't install that uh but you know not that kind of advice right but you know specifically for software developers 
Right, right. So uh, for software developers, I think the the, the primary um, vector, you know, for for malicious code running uh, in your environment or really any developer environment uh, along the way. It doesn't just have to be your system. It could be your CI, CD servers, and your runners. Um, it's going to be software dependencies, third-party code, right? Mm -hmm. Code code from strangers on the internet, right? That's that's really <laughs> what it boils down to. Is, you know, it's... They're, they're just, Charlie, they're just here to help out. They, <laughs> they're just giving you the code to help out. They have no bad intentions. <laughs> right, right. Except well, for that one. That one, the one over there. Don't take their code. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 hard to tell, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what's good, what's bad, and I think I think we all rely on third party code. I mean, it's I think it's a rare rare company, rare project that that writes everything from scratch on their own without any any dependencies. Um, yeah. So that's 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 a vector for sure is is allowing code from strangers on the internet to to run. <laughs> I think like the name of the game, right? In in uh, for for attackers and uh, threat actors is arbitrary code execution. Like that's the key yeah. phrase: arbitrary code execution. If 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 I can get arbitrary code execution. With this vulnerability, then then mm. I've won. I can. You're I gonna can get a CVE score system. of nine or above. <laughs> so right there, and then. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's and that's for yeah. vulnerabilities. That's just you know poorly written code or code with bugs. Um, but forget about vulnerabilities. I mean, if if you if you're an attacker, you're a threat actor, you've already got the perfect means to run arbitrary code to, to gain mm -hmm. arbitrary code execution on a developer system. And that's with third-party dependencies. Open source software is just the perfect target for um, writing writing malware or yeah. slipping malware into into packages. And now, when people hear this, they we've talked about it enough. It actually came as quite a surprise a few years ago. People theoretically knew that it happen it could happen, but that it was happening is that packages on package stores like PyPI and NPM and so on got published vulnerabilities that people could then install and, and make part of theirs. But there's a whole software supply chain, right? Maybe talk us through some of the different elements that make that up. Only one of which is these libraries, right? That's right. That's right. So the software supply chain is, it's really, it's using third-party code securely uh, as well as securing the end-to-end -end development process. So that process is, you know, very broadly broken into three phases. You've got the the source phase, that's, you know, source control management systems, and then actual, actually coding, developers coding yeah. on their systems, you know, committing to, to uh, repositories. Um, yeah, and having, you know, you mentioned the, um, the dependencies, like, pip install this or that yep. there's also for many of the really popular ids and editors there's a whole massive array of various levels of trusted plugins or extensions right as well that's right yeah um like visual studio code that's that's what i use for my ide mm -hmm. you know it's got a extensive extension ecosystem um just about anything you want to do, you know, I get a little pop-up when I open a new project and it says, oh, I recognize you're using a YAML file. Do you want to download this extension that will yeah. lint YAML files, right? Like, Yeah, I got one for CVEs. For that. It was like <laughs> rainbow C CSV syntax highlighter or something. I'm like, you know what? That's not really made by a trusted company. It's probably fine. <laughs> fine. But I don't need my C CSV files highlighted so much so that I'm willing to just like run arbitrary code from a stranger on the that's, internet. That's right. Right. Yep. And you know, I use both PyCharm and VS Code, and they both, especially PyCharm, has sort of a warning that says this is untrusted. It's a third party thing. Are you sure you want it? But just say you no. know, that's a pretty light warning. <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah. they're not, they're not the same, right? Is it installed by a million people, used every day, or is it are you the fourth person to use it? And it right hasn't right. you know, yeah, hasn't, hasn't had the experience of people going, 
why is it called open in a network socket? What's it doing? <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another another entry point. You got to be gotta be uh, careful about. And All right, well, I cut you off. We're only in like square one of maybe yeah, nine yeah, square in the one, supply chain. Source code, <laughs> and and then and then there's the build the build phase. Uh, that's that's where you take the code, you take the commits uh, that have gone into source control, um, and and you. You build something with it, right? This usually happens in you know your CI CD systems, like mm -hmm. GitHub, you get GitHubs and GitLabs of the world, um, and it's at that point where um, you know your third-party dependencies get get included and and wrapped up into your your artifacts, right? Which mm -hmm. um, brings us to the third stage um, of the software supply chain, which is the package and deploy phase. Um, that's where you're creating your artifacts and um, you know, making them available to the world mm -hmm. to use. Could so, be anything. Could be a, a wheel for a, a library that other parts of your company use to build software. Yep. Could Wheels, be uh, some app you ship. It could actually be a website, an API. Who knows, right? Yeah. A, a, a Docker, a Docker container. container. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And then by the time you get to the to that, you know, the end of the of the supply chain and you know the products or the 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 packaged um, product that, that people are gonna see and use and, and work with, um, you know, you've 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 baked in so many elements at that point, you know, from mm -hmm. your third party dependencies to um, um, you know, any any other uh, I don't know, external resources that, that yeah. are getting called. So, so there's lots yeah, of, I, lots of points along the way that, that mm -hmm. it's, it's possible to. And, um, yeah. One exactly. of the things that can be sneaky is, you know, it doesn't happen that often in Python, but if you're shipping like a windows or a Mac app, there's a digital signature proof of we're going to sign this with our trusted certificate. So it, it doesn't even give you any warnings. Like, look, this is, it's signed by the company. It is trusted. Here you go. Take it. Right. And yeah. if somewhere up, up, upstream from that, there's an issue like with packages or other things. Well, that issue is now that that problem is signed and verified as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you mentioned, you mentioned code, code signing. Um, uh, the research team at our at our company. I mean, they're amazing, amazing um, group there. They're always finding new and novel attacks. And one they found just this past week uh, involved um, something some kind of cool where the attacker had bundled up a valid Microsoft um, binary. It had been signed by Microsoft, uh, but they bundled it with with a, a DLL that um, was malicious. It was named Oh yeah, something to be expected, right? So, so when you run the executable <laughs> on the binary, um, you know you could see that there's this Microsoft signs um, uh, application, yeah, uh, looking for permissions, looking to, to to continue, and you think, oh yeah, great, signed by Microsoft, no problem. But then it uses this technique called like DLL search or, search order hijacking, um, mm -hmm. okay, that technique, right? So if 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 you have a DLL that's being called by the application more locally than uh, not. It's that's I what's see. So called. it's so looking it's for something in like, yeah. It'll look in like the, looking for the, for the name of the DLL in this in the same directory first. Basically, is what's happening. And right. Right. They had, they had so shipped their bad DLL with. Oh, that's good nuts. Binary. So you pick <laughs> you pick something in system thirty two that's got like a real common name like. VC runtime whatever dot DLL or you yeah. know some some of the standard ones, but then you you completely reprogram it, yeah, and stick yeah. it in there with that app, or maybe not completely because you need the app to not crash, but you give it some extra boost when <laughs> when it does something, right? Yeah, yeah. In this case, they had they had just um, copied uh, all the files needed for execution into a new directory, uh, including the known good binary, the known bad DLL. And then mm -hmm. you know, it had everything it needed in that directory to run, and it looked like it was legitimate. <laughs> right, because a lot of the OS dependent, a lot of these OS checks are on the executable, mm -hmm. not the system libraries that they use. Right. Right. 
right? All right. You'll see like this, this executable is downloaded from the internet. Do you sure you want to run it? Like that doesn't say this executable, what you trust is maybe possibly using a library that you downloaded. Like it doesn't say that, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because we could never get work done if there's that <laughs> level of <laughs> checking all over the place. Right? This is an updated somewhere. All right, so that's kind of the the space that we're talking about, right? We've got editors, we've got libraries that you use, CI, CD pipelines, containers are super interesting as well, and all the tools to go with those. So let's talk through some of the the posts that you've written and, and also just selected about some of these things, and maybe starting to the front of that list there with lock files. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I yes, I wrote a I wrote a blog post. I guess it's looking at the date on your screen. It looks like it was uh, over a year ago now. And probably um, seems like yesterday, but no. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> 2022, right. it was. So, so I'm sure the landscape has changed since then a bit, and maybe there's some new players out there. But um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, one thing you can do as a developer, uh, you know, a big one I would recommend is. Um, Use lock files for your dependencies, right? And um, you know, what's a lock file? Well, it's yeah. it's the it's the it's the uh, fully resolved um, set of dependencies that are that are used by your application, your package, um, and you know, yeah. if 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 nothing else, like. You should know you should know what's going into your code, right? Like what? Right. Uh, well, not just one of the ways this helps. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's a really that's a bit of a challenge, right? And I think I, I'll I'll admit when I first got into Python, I didn't do this that well, and you know, to me, it felt like the probably the biggest issue I might run into is instability in my app, right? Like for example, if I don't pin a dependency, some new thing comes out. I reinstall it on a new computer. Maybe it gets an upgraded version and there's some library that doesn't work, right? I mean, there's been certainly popular libraries that just said we're we're having a major version change and we're fixing the mistakes we made 10 years ago and these three functions are changing or whatever, right? That would break it. But it could also be there's now a malicious version of library X and that's version two. But if you pinned it on version one, even though it's bad, you're still not getting the bad one, at least for a while, right? Absolutely, yes. Um, so I think I got to look it up. I always forget. PEP665. OK. Um, yeah, PEP665. It was it's a rejected pep, unfortunately, but it but it was written by by Brett Cannon and some others. I know you've had Brett on the show a number of times. Uh, I love I love the stuff he does. You know, he yeah, really he does excellent work. Um, yeah. And it's it's kind of a shame this was rejected, but this pep tried to um, create a a standard lock file format for Python. Um, and you know, if you if you look into the pep a little bit, that you know, there's some motivation about like why you'd want to do this, and you know, four big reasons. And the third one is the one I really key on, which is that. You know, lock files allow for reproducibility, and mm -hmm. reproducibility is just more secure because when you know, I'm, I'm quoting here from the PEP says, when you control exactly what files are installed, you can make sure no malicious actor is attempting to slip nefarious code into your application, i.e., yeah. some supply chain attacks. By using a lock file, which always leads to reproducible installs, we can avoid certain risks entirely. And I mean, that's that's. That's the name of the game. That's like that's <laughs> that, that's what our our yeah. company focuses on, which is um, uh, avoiding those risks by ensuring yeah. you know which dependencies you're using, and you're knowing that those dependencies are are benign or good, and, you know, doing no harm. Even even if there is something that happens, usually it's going to happen to a popular library because you're using it. Hence, probably other people are using it. Other than typo squatting, which we'll, we can talk about, but yeah, you know, if you pin your dependencies, chances are it's these things only stick around for a little while. It's not like oh, they discovered it had been there for eight months. It's like oh my gosh, we heard about it. <laughs> a few people got it, and then we got rid of it, right? Yes, the folks yes. at PyPA are pretty excellent. So it's it's to some degree a timing issue as well. Yes, um, 
Yeah, vulnerabilities are are different, right? Where that's that's what a lot of people focus on. A lot of the tooling exists to to you know discover vulnerabilities in your in your dependencies, which is right. good to know about those. But those exist for a long time, right? You have CVEs for known vulnerabilities, and they end up in these databases, and they're there for years. And if you're using old dependencies or maybe transitive dependencies uh, are using old ones and you're stuck on it, then you're going to be exposed to those vulnerabilities. But what's yeah, it, what's different examples, about the... Sorry, examples of those yeah. include the WebP library not too long ago, right? Uh -huh, that uh -huh. was baked into Python and then also OpenSSL, right? So people discovered issues in those. Those are baked into different aspects of Python or some of the libraries. And it's like, well... All of a sudden, there's this fire drill, yes, which is different than somebody going, "I'm going to sneak a thing into the library." Right, system. and and then and then it is a timing matter. So malicious dependencies—that's a whole other story. Because if someone, if a malicious um, package is discovered, there's not a CVE created for it. The package is just taken off of the registry. You know, you mm -hmm. report it to to the, to the good people at PyPI, and uh, you know they'll they'll review the submission and take it down. I've done a, a few of those myself, and yeah. Um, they're they're really fast, but there's still there's still a window of time where that malicious package, that malicious dependency is is up and available, and that's you know yeah. So I, often, I do think pinning your dependency helps. Yeah, exactly. I do think having a pin dependency there is is worthwhile because if you you make a commit, your CI runs, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like the chances that you just bump the version to this malicious thing is pretty low. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, um, yeah, and it having version ranges is not enough. You know, you need to have explicit versions. You know, not... all right. Let's talk more about these uh, lock files then. Yes. Right. So there's there's actually a bunch of choices these days, and you know, Brett's pep tried to <laughs> make it less of a choice. Say, well, it doesn't matter if you use hatch or pip or poetry or whatever, the outcome is the same, and for reasons that I don't haven't learned enough about i don't know why that didn't work but let's talk about what's out there now because there's a couple options at this point sure um i think the yeah so most python developers are going to be most familiar with 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 pip right that's mm -hmm. that's the that's the standard um and pip has requirements files and it, you know they're they're unique in in the uh, in the lock file world because uh they can be named anything, right? Most most other lock files have a defined name. We we're talking about Rust earlier. You know, they're the gold standard for a lot of this stuff, and you know, they're very clear. They have cargo dot lock. That's their lock file. You can't you can't yeah. name it anything else. It, its contents are well defined. Uh, it is what it is. But in Python with pip, <laughs> I mean, you could name it whatever you want. You know, dev requirements dot txt. Yeah. You could name it cargo dot lock. <laughs> But it could contain <laughs> Python <laughs> dependencies in it. Surprise! You know? I'm yeah, not Rust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And basically, you can just put more or less arbitrary commands that are sent to pip in yes, any text yes, file, right? Exactly. Which is more or less any, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yep. Yep. Any any command line option you can feed the pip, you can put in a in a requirements file. Um, it's cool because you can have a you import by saying dash r some other file. Yes, yes. But yes. it's also not the hierarchy structured. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so there are there are some tools available to to turn those like loose requirements files, the pip requirements files, into into strict um, mm -hmm. lock files, right? Where every every entry is uh, pinned to a specific version, and uh, pip itself can do it with the pip freeze command. Um, so that's that's the one yeah. most people know about, but that one's kind of not so great because it only freezes the packages for the environment that you ran pip freeze in, you know, and maybe you're trying yeah. to uh, publish your your lock file for users of a different uh, platform or system. The other thing that I don't like about it is you want to put just the things you actually use into your requirements file. Like I'm using HTTPX and Pydantic. That's it, but what it really installs when you run that is the transitive closure of yes, all those things, which is right. fine, but you're you're not necessarily expressing that with just your requirements.txt, right? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your two packages could, could balloon to, you know, a hundred dependencies. Um, and that's not uncommon. It's not even that bad. Like in the JavaScript ecosystem, you know, the same handful of, of uh, top level dependencies could have a two orders of magnitude explosion where you end up with. There's a, thousands. there's a really, there's a, oh gosh, I can't find out. You know what? I think it's on, I think I put it on the Python Vice, but there's a really funny, I want to be able to pull this up for people so they can find it. There's a funny, funny um, thing that somebody did, uh, well, you know, for some definition of funny. <laughs> <laughs> they put, um, somebody created an uh, NPM package called everything. And yes. there's, so there's an article called when Everything Becomes Too Much, the NPM uh -huh. Package Chaos of 2024. <laughs> yeah. An NPM user named Patrick JS launched a troll campaign with a package called Everything, which depends on every package in NPM. Yeah, yeah. And that's I think I think it's the NPMs are the largest uh, package registry out there. So it's I mean it's already uh, <laughs> massive. I remember your early episodes, you would you would recount how many uh packages were on PyPI and then we we, we got I don't to even know are we past half a million number. well yeah, yeah I remember we it was a big deal we got up to a hundred thousand and now it's yeah what four hundred thousand five hundred thousand five hundred and eight thousand five hundred and nine okay. by rounding yeah, yeah. <laughs> half a million and congratulations world <laughs> amazing yeah yeah I just added two new ones last week so I guess I made a huge difference in that number <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah so basically P the pip is awesome and it does a gr bunch of great stuff and one of the things I really like about working with pip is I don't need to teach people anything if they want to work with my project right I don't need to teach them like oh I know you love poetry, but I'm using a combination of the hatch build backend with PDM. You're like, what? I don't even know what those are, right? <laughs> like it's, there's a lot of like ways in which you work that are brought in with a lot of these tools here. So PIP is kind of like, you know, it just kind of works, right? Yes. But uh, th having this transitive closure managed is not part of what it does, but it's super important because if I need to upgrade something, I can't just change my version number in my, requirements because that doesn't affect its dependency possibly right like it yeah. depends on what it's it said so i'm a huge fan of pip tools this is actually what i do most of the time yes pip tools is another another one um you you, you can um it's 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 great i think it has this pip com compile uh, uh command that will take as an input i think just about any python manifest type that's out there so you can do um setup.py requirements dot uh txt um yeah, i'm forgetting i'm forgetting the other ones uh mm -hmm. the, the pip env.lock maybe i don't know setup.cfg yeah. pyproject.toml mm -hmm. it you know it just yeah. it just recognizes yeah. all the different ways people could express their uh their loose requirements you know the, the manifest files um yeah so yeah yeah, pip, yeah pip, so i really like it and you can say pip pip compile upgrade and it'll look at all the dependencies and upgrade them all as high as they can go but what's nice about that is you'll be working for a while then you choose like well let me just do a refresh on the dependencies right now and repin them and see how that works and then just carry on with your business for a while right um and it'll right. manage that tra transitive closure as well with like a, actually a really nice lock file that where it described like these are all the things in the lock file and the reason that you know for example in your blog post you say they're certify of this version and it's there because you asked for it and because request needs it you know right. if you're like why is this in my why is this in my virtual environment why do i have this weird thing that i don't know like it'll tell you here's why it's there yeah yeah one of the one of the downsides though i, I think pip tools has this this issue i know pip does is that um in determining that uh, transitive dependency resolution, um, it is very possible, in fact, usually happens that you have arbitrary code execution on your system, right? Like if mm -hmm. you start with the two top level dependencies, like you mentioned, uh, and it lists dependencies, well, then it'll, it'll pull those in and it, and it acquires the metadata um, from the wheel if, if that exists. Uh, mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, it'll build the package just to get the metadata file, just to figure out which dependencies that needs. Um, and Are so you saying you I up, should set up a like a Docker container to I execute mean, this? That's that's yeah, that's kind of what's happening. Maybe, I, just, should, yeah. Maybe <laughs> I should, yeah. And and um, you know, 
yeah, running in a sandbox is another another option, right? Where and that's 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 what that's what my company and Phylum, that's one of the solutions we offer. Um, you know, we have extensions for our CLI where you can you can wrap pip by just calling phylum pip and then mm -hmm. everything runs in the sandbox so that's that's oh, another really? solution okay. yeah 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 so good because i mean pip is a funny one because they even have a command line option called dry run tac tac dry mm -hmm. run which you mm -hmm. would think oh nothing's gonna happen on my system it's just, <laughs> it's just running code from strangers on the internet but it that does part. yes dry <laughs> run even using dry run for pip install and, and pip download commands will or has the possibility of of downloading and running arbitrary code from strangers on the internet. Well, <laughs> you know, if we had oh, well, wheels came along af far after pip, right? And we've got the source distributions and setup.py and all that kind of stuff. And so, if wheels existed from day one, it mm -hmm. very well be the case that this is not a problem, right? But you know, what is pip supposed to do? Like, it has to evaluate this dynamic thing to figure out what it wants yes yes yeah yeah wheels are great because you know they have a metadata file in there that it, that clearly lays out what the what what the dependencies are and there's no arbitrary code running when you install a wheel it's just it's just extracting and copying you know yeah a, a wheel is just a zip file you extract that zip file and then copy the contents to various locations but yes as you said because we've had um source distributions, tarballs, and then even eggs before that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm probably never going to fully get rid of those. Um, it just takes one, one, one dependency anywhere in your chain that mm -hmm. is only distributed as a source distribution before now you're downloading and building a package just to get metadata to yeah, and maybe you didn't actually choose path. it, right? It's it's the dependency of a dependency of a dependency. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. You know, people often uh, re respond to um, some of the findings our, our company has, where we'll you know we'll post these malicious packages with all sorts of crazy names, and people will respond to say like, you know, why why would I install that? Like, why would I ever install this this you know? random package that, that no one's heard of it's like well you wouldn't it's 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 it could be but it could be included in you know the transit dependencies right if it gets if it gets added to um, a slightly more legitimate package or you know worked up the chain that way then then uh yes eventually you know you'll be running it unknowingly yeah I think there's two important things we should talk about this before we move on, mm -hmm. um, because there are some interesting ways in which you might unknow it. You might even try to do the right thing, and you might actually shoot yourself in the foot by doing so. Uh, so, w number one, these like super strict lock files are awesome when you're building an application. I want to yeah. ship Talk Python training out. It's got its strict APIs. It runs on this version. It uses that version of Pydantic, that version of Beanie, and whatever. Yeah. I want that to be fixed, fixed, zero flexibility until I decide through maybe a pip compile upgrade or whatever that I want a new one. However, if I was building a library that someone else was using, I would do them many headaches and a disservice to say I <laughs> I depend on Pydantic 2.7.0. You're like, but my other library needs Pydantic 8, 2.8, right. 8, right. and I can't use it. And your library together, right? So you need the it's it's a different story when you're building a library that others are going to consume than it is when you're building an application. And there was some um, some disagreement, I guess, about the recommendation of pip env for a while. And it's because I believe the pip env is really focused on the application side. And it I don't think it was made super clear that maybe it doesn't make as much sense for libraries, right? So do you want right. to speak to that a little? Yeah, yeah. Um I'm I'm an advocate for lock files for everyone, right? Applications for sure, but also libraries and their developers, right? Because you know, uh, if when you when you when you um, distribute a library, sure, it, you know, um, loose dependencies is is probably the way to go there. Um, but library developers, people who want to contribute to your projects, um, the developers themselves, maybe you work on a team. Um, having having a lock file alongside um, 
your library is still going to be useful, right? Like, yeah, because that uh, way you can say everyone, if, if somebody makes a change or they report a bug or whatever, they're not bringing in a change from a different version of a dependency or like maybe something changed, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and then, and then it, plus it still allows you to um, start from a known good spot. And then uh, maybe, maybe if you, um, um, if you know you want to uh, get the latest, then you can do it in a controlled environment, you know, like a mm -hmm. sandbox, or maybe yeah. a, on CI in a in a throwaway runner that has no access to any any secrets or <laughs> uh, yeah. sensitive. That's um, interesting. I I hadn't really thought about having a specific re requirements lock file type of thing for for the libraries that I've been working on. For the developers, right? For people who want to contribute, um, because it's just been like a loose requirement so that people that build against it aren't pinned into some very specific thing. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense, I think. Yeah. There's a there's a link in that blog post. It, it's kind of dated now, but it's from the folks who built Yarn, you know, mm -hmm. the JavaScript yeah. system. But um, they had they say it a lot more eloquently than I can. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, Lock files should lock be committed on all projects yeah it's i mean it's it's a bit old now but the, but they they go down the lists and spell it out a lot more clearly than me about why yeah. uh libraries even can benefit from from publishing yeah, okay a, a yeah file. people can yeah people can check that out that's cool yeah yeah and java that's the javascript package manager so in javascript years it's like a hundred years or something that's been a couple years <laughs> that's right <Yeah. laughs> you got dog years you got javascript years javascript years just tick by like second the second hand yeah yeah <laughs> All right, uh, cool. So I see we're making great progress through our list of things to talk about here. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone through three and we've got like 15 left. We'll have plenty of time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's see. So another one, another pep I think we're talking about here is 517, a build system independent format for source trees. I have no idea what this is. What is this? Yeah, PEP 517 and 518 kind of go together. This is this was like the transition away from setup.py towards pyproject.toml. Uh, 518 is the one that specifies pyproject.toml, um, kind of things that go in it. And then 5, 517 is all about um, build systems and build backends. Mm -hmm. uh, so so like in your pyproject.toml and your in your in your uh, uh, build system key, you know, you often see things like um, poetry core or flit or hatchling or right. um, these kinds of things. And and so it's five, PEP 517 is, is specifying what it means to be one of those build backends. Um, and it's really just defining two mandatory hooks. What does it mean to build wheel and build sdist? Uh, there's three optional hooks as well. And I think there's even another PEP that followed on from this that talks about uh, building editable uh, packages or, or um, right. the, the dash the, the da dash E equivalents. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but really, it just boils down to uh, defining a way to build a wheel and build a source distribution. Yeah, and this is part of what opened up all the the different choices we now have for package management and things like that, right? Because now there's a, a common way they can all work together. A little bit like WSGI. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, I've been so, using Hatchling for my build back in recently and it's been working real nicely. Okay. Yeah, I uh I was just looking at Hatchling the other day and they've got yeah, yeah, they they're one of the they're one of the build backends that offers um, build hooks, mm. which you know so <laughs> prior to uh, um, pyproject.toml and 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 uh, uh, wheels and beta wheels, and you, you go back to the source distributions, you know, and your setup.py files where it's just Python code. You could be you could be doing anything in your setup.py mm -hmm. file, mm -hmm. uh, which runs when you install the package. Um, well, now we're starting to see, you know, methods to do the same thing in these in these more modern packaging or build backends. So like Hatch has their um, um, build hooks, build yeah. system hooks where you can you can you can you can uh, point it to 
think yeah, just Python code and have it have it run as part of the the build. Yeah, at least it only runs at build time, not install time. Uh, right. Yeah, I'm looking at the documentation now. I, I, uh, yeah, this is still new to me, but there might be hooks for for in, install as well. Build. Okay. Mm. While you're thinking about it, one of yeah. the things uh, I got a couple of questions I want to highlight yep. from the the audience here, but also one of the one of the things that I think maybe was considered. I have no awareness of this, but if it wasn't, it would be excellent. Is what if the people at PIP just pre-computed all that metadata from at least for the common platforms that you would get that PIP needs to download run setup pi and then throw it away just to get that data like for mac windows and linux you know if it would just go okay we're just gonna like as you upload it, it would just kick off a job that does that on those three platforms and puts it in a json blob yeah it seems like that would be there, worthwhile i i I'm, I'm fairly certain there's discussions already around that type of a, a solution and maybe even a pep for a proposal um for it but uh, yeah, getting away from having to build a package just to get metadata. Uh, yeah, there, there, I mean, you got discussion for packages it. that are downloaded billions of times with a B. It's insane. Mm -hmm. And if somebody could do that three times instead of a billion times, it would make it work faster and it would also make it safe, right? I think it'd yeah. be great. Yeah. All right, a couple of questions here. Uh, this one. So Tony on the audience says, pip compile is great for finding your transitive dependencies one interesting thing that they've done is package up code with pants build which supports locks files just to look through what code gets packaged up is this anything you've explored uh, i've heard of pants i haven't looked into it myself yet mm -hmm. um, okay yeah so yeah so just use it like go okay you're going to have to build this thing and give me a little manifest and whatnot and then we can just look at that that's cool yeah. and then tamir says do you have a solution for taking already locked dependencies with you when you start a new app i'm guessing huh. you know, maybe um, yeah i don't know i i guess maybe you've already got a project you're working on you want to say like i want this project to use that and probably you could just copy the the lock file right yeah yeah if you i mean if you really i mean really you're gonna if you start a new project um or a new application you're gonna you're gonna have new uh manifest file you know pyproject.toml maybe you have the same dependencies the top level dependencies or not but the the fully resolved set of dependencies that makes up your lock file that that, that can very easily be different so i'm i'm not exactly sure how you yeah. just pour it over one to another one more bit from tony and this is um something that i now remember from pants is says if it just looks through your code and if you use the import statement regardless of whether you put it in your requirements files it'll huh. figure out what your requirements files should have been if you were a bad developer basically <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of okay. cool just to see yeah. what it uses yeah nice all right uh on to the next thing Specifying PEP 518, specifying minimum build system requirements for Python projects. This yeah, five, five this, related... this is pyproject.toml. This is the this is the the PEP for that. Um, okay. There's not much to it other than to say that they they settled on that name, <laughs> rejected a bunch of other possibilities, and then they've got the you know the the few entries that are required like for your your defining your build Excellent. system. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to have a pyproject.toml for Python, but no, yeah. if you're building a Python library and you don't want to use setup.py, then you're much better off having a pyproject.toml, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's more on the library side that it, I mean, it's not that you can't use it on an application, but it's more required on the library side. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing. All right, so let's talk about some of the ways in which your packages might go wrong. We've already talked about typo squatting, and we also talked about everything. That's different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, your typo squatting is, it is tricky. I think it's pretty well understood at this this point, but maybe just tell people real quick to, to yeah. cover that base, you know? Sure. Type, typo squatting is, is, you know, 
publishing a package with a, a name that's similar but not the same as as a as an existing known good package, right? So, like instead of requests, maybe you you get request without the s or yeah, um, you know, one that gets me because I because I make the typo all the time was is the cryptography package, uh, like. Like if I, you know, if I put you on the spot, would you know how to spell cryptography? You yeah. know, right away. I always get the first couple of letters, you know, jumbled up a bit, and and there have been malicious packages published and then taken down, um, with with uh, you know, spelled C R P Y instead of C R Y P, cryptography, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but but the idea is that you know, uh, you 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 can overlook a package because it looks like a it looks like a good one no it's not necessarily that you're gonna you're gonna install it because you type it wrong um although that is that is you know one technique right the drive-by installs where someone just fat fingers uh the package name um but really having a um, typo squatted package is going to allow these threat actors to uh, be a little more stealthy in their inclusion of that package in in legitimate um, code reviews and, and commits and uh, dependencies of dependencies, right? And so yeah, the other the other thing that goes with typo squatting, I don't know if I had a link for you there yet, um, is is star jacking. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, if you're going to typo squat on a known good package, okay, there there it is. Um, you know, these these uh, these threat actors, they just they just straight up copy the known good project, right? It's just, it, it just clone the repository and then change the package name, um, and and then when they when they post the package to uh, PyPI, for instance, um, the metadata that goes with the package uh, still exists, right? So uh, on PyPI for a given package, you can see on the left hand side it shows like some some statistics if if the um, uh, URL was given to uh -huh. like a GitHub hosted project, for instance, awesome. um, it'll go in there and tell you how many stars. Oh, that right, right, has, right. You know, yeah, how that, many that's actually a signal that it seems like it should be good, right? It'll have a yeah, lot, of those, a lot and say. that's what star jacking is doing is it's just type. copying the metadata of a known good package uh, so that on first look, go. yeah, there you go. You can see. Like um, I did pull that pie test and it says statistics, GitHub statistics, 11,000 stars, 2,000 forks. Okay, this is legit. Let's install it. Right. So I could go clone pie test repository right now, change the name to pie test spelled P I T E S T, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then push the math version of testing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you're going to get these same statistics and you're going to get the same uh, maintainers that you see if you scroll down a little bit uh, in the, the, uh, metadata yeah so you get the maintainers list all of that metadata that you 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 enter in your pyproject.toml or set up that pi file um gets read here on pypi and just just published so you can you can fake people out yeah by, yeah by... that's actually really <laughs> okay well there's a new terrifying thing that i hadn't thought about. yeah yeah so so star jacking <laughs> and typo squatting where you just take a known good package clone it and then maybe you you make a change to um, yeah. you know, existing function, you know, the function does what it's supposed to do, but it also does some other stuff like ship off secrets from your, your CI server or, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it could lay dormant and wait for, uh, <laughs> some sort of production environment and grab some SSH keys or something terrible. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's the yeah, other, indeed. The other, the other thing. yeah, dependency confusion. Okay, that's the next yeah. one you've got up. Yeah, this is the one we kind of talked. It's similar to what we talked about uh, before with, um, yeah, I can't remember, but I said there's, they're going to come back to this. So here, here it is again. This is dependency confusion where um, if you get the wrong version or the wrong name, it, or, it could actually, you try same, to be safe by having a whitelisted list or say, well, uh, it's, it's, so this is one where it's the, the same. Same package name, different source of where you acquire that package. Yes. So this is um, you. These attacks are mostly like a, a, a companies, enterprises. This is this is the People enterprise gonna, attack. Yeah. 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 So we're using so, Artifactory, and we we only put our stuff there, and we're we're gonna call it like, you know, international company underscore data access. That's right. And <laughs> and it's and it's 
and it's tricky because if you don't know, like if you don't have your build system set up in a way and, and then uh, your CI server set up in a way to install your dependencies in the proper order, like excluding public registries first and only looking for packages in your private registry, then it's very easy, especially with PIP, which defaults to looking on PyPI, the public registry first, and then only falling back to your, your extra index URL specifications secondly. Um, that if you, uh, if someone had the knowledge or just guessed at the package name that you had published on your internal registry, and then they made their own package with the same name, but put it on PyPI, that's the one that's going to get installed. Um, and there was like a whole series of, you know, uh, bug bounties that were claimed over this back a few years ago because people just went around, you know, guessing at internal package names, or maybe they it's, used to work there or new people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll pay you hundred bucks to, just to share your requirements at TXT with me. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. You know, so. it's um, it's kind of, it's extra sneaky because it only affects people, it only affects people who are going out of their way to be more secure, right? They're going out of their way to say, <laughs> we're only gonna, we're gonna actually set up a whole server and we're gonna whitelist a bunch of stuff. You can only ask for the names of the things on this server and ah, Yes, you know. yes. And that, that might still work if you limit it to your internal registry only or a mirror perhaps of, yeah. of the, uh, the public registries. Um, what do you think about that? It's pretty easy to create your own internal copy, download a bunch of external ones and mirror them locally and say like, these are the ones that are pre-approved at our company, nothing else. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I worked in a, an environment where that's exactly what we did. And yeah. um, I, I think there is merit to that. You just have to know that anything you're mirroring to the trusted internal network is in fact secure, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think you know, it doesn't really make sense, except for a few very rare cases to say you cannot use external dependencies, right? right? Yeah, it, you're just saying what we want is to not build software, but while the rest of the world does, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. because that's part of the magic. We just saw that it's over half a million libraries you can choose from. Mm -hmm. When you say we, we have zero of those, you're really, really constraining the type of software and the velocity at which you can build. Yeah, right. yeah, it, it, so, it, yeah. It reminds me of um, was that line, you know, like why, why do you rob banks? Because because they have the money. Because that's where the money is, right? It's like, <laughs> well, why do attackers? Why are attackers going after open source software now? It's like, well, cause that's that's where it's easiest to get arbitrary code to run. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's where developers are. That's what. That's uh, to be fair, though, it's not are. only it's not only right. There's solar winds which really had almost nothing to do with open source, but it had to do with CI, CD systems and other sneakiness, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and got into places that, you know, instead of getting into the libraries, you get into the build system and you just give it a little extra, a little extra include <laughs> tag there in your code <laughs> or bringing that DLL, like you said, right? right? So dependency and confusion is sneaky because you're asking for a local version off a local server. It doesn't exist on PyPI, but if it could be made to exist on PyPI, all of a sudden that gets installed. That's potentially, that's not good. Potentially, yeah, yeah. It's it's that's that's how it works in, in, in all the in all the default cases, and it's it's pretty tricky actually to to exclude <laughs> to do it in the correct <laughs> yeah. order and exclude those public registries. Yeah, what's um what I do to help this is I just. I just run the UUID command to get one of those 16 digit arbitrary hex things. And I just name all my libraries that. And so it's like, oh, do you have the, the, the F3DC? Yeah. Like, that's, the, that's the API one. That's right. That's import that, right? No one is going to do this. It's, it's such a safe space. I tell you. All right. On to the yeah, next one. That, that would work. Um, expired author domains. This is super sneaky. Yeah, yeah. So this is one. Um, it, you know, it it might be less of a factor now. I think I think it was just earlier this month that PyPI enforced two-factor authentication for all their users. Um, but 
a lot of uh, sites and um, you know even PyPI, I think before <laughs> this month, uh, have you know password reset features where if yeah. if you lose access to your account or you forget your password, just you know send me an email, and reset your password. Um, but it's 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 very possible that people you know years ago submitted a package, they they don't maintain it anymore. They submitted it under. Uh, an old email account that has expired, right? Maybe they they had they some domain, domain. yeah. Special it doesn't work that well for Gmail or Outlook, right? right. right. If yeah, you had custom, custom domain, if you had a custom domain, and, and as would be awesome, have your own, you know, Michael at talkpython.fm, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Say you you uh, win the lottery and and uh, I'm you out. Decide to Beach quit your job. Yeah, and then you let your <laughs> domain expire and. Well, maybe there's still a linkage for the Talk Python domain yeah. to PyPI, and then I go and buy that domain and you know request Set password up some server, yeah, account Set reset, email. yeah, and then now I now I can uh, publish new versions of of the, of the packages there. Yeah, yeah, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't really know what to do about that one, but there's an amazing <laughs> there's an amazing joke that I found on Mastodon. Um, Somebody posted, sit here. <laughs> it's uh, two big red buttons. Think Ren and Stimpy or whatever. And one yeah. of the red buttons says, admit to yourself that your dream is dead. The other one says, pay $12 yeah. right? On do for domain renewal, right? Yes. And it's, I mean, it's funny, but there's plenty of people who will get a domain. Like, yeah. I'm going to totally go in. And then it's like, you know what? I haven't done anything with that for like five years. I'm not paying another 12 bucks. But if they had set up an account under that, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That's why you got to buy your domains for that hundred year renewal period. Exactly. <laughs> you take out. You take out that loan. You get your domain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're getting short on time here. I want right. to. Um, let me. Let's just go through. I'll just list off a few real quick. Maybe we do lightning round. Okay. Okay. Unverifiable dependency. Okay. These are for. Um, Specifying dependencies that are not necessarily uh, published to PyPI, right? So that maybe you're pointing to um, uh, a GitHub repository. You know, pip calls these yeah. uh, VCS project URLs. You know, if you if you look in their their help output. Yeah, it's like pip install git plus HTTP to yeah, a thing that has yeah, a exactly. project atom right. or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that and that thing it can point to a repository. Maybe it points to a tag. Maybe it points to uh, a branch. Um, none of that is stable, right? Like you, the 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 tag could change out from under you. The code that's uh, uh, related to that tag could, could change out from under you. The the code at the branch you're pointing to could change, um, while the name remains the same. So. You know, those are those are those are risky for that reason, right? If if you're not yeah. pinning to a very specific version or a very specific hash, right? If you're going to point to a repository or a, a Git URL, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Make yeah. sure it, it's. I kind of feel a lot of times like the hash is maybe a little bit redundant, given the immutability of PyPI. But if you're pointing at something like this, then maybe all of a sudden you really, really do want that. <laughs> yes. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, repo jacking. Can yeah, this is, this is similar links? to the. Um, expired author domain, right? So if someone mm -hmm. was you know, pointing to one of those Git dependencies, a, pro a VCS project URL, as Pip calls it, and uh, you know, that account went dormant or expired, relinquished, whatever, and someone else took it over, um, then yeah, that, they can now, they can now uh, dictate. Change what's what's what, there, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's what people are, are requiring. <laughs> Yep. All right. Uh, and then maybe last bit, get a chance to talk a bit about um, your Phylum CI project. I do want to point out really quick, though, that Phylum was a sponsor of the show yes. a while ago, but this is not a sponsored episode. This is just right. you and I have been talking prior to that, actually, and decided to like put this show together. So just to be clear, but let's talk about this, uh, what this project you guys got anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you can pip install Phylum right now, or 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 like I prefer pipx pipx install Phylum. Yeah, I love I love pipx. It's awesome. Oh, me too. Yeah, I've 
I think I heard about it from you, actually. <laughs> but, uh, um, so the circle goes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so this this package it does two main things. It, one is it can it'll uh, it'll expose us to entry points. One of them is is called phylum init, and that'll that'll get you the phylum um, command line interface written in Rust, <laughs> but installed with with Python. Uh, <laughs> um, it'll get you the 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 phylum CLI locally and then the other one is is called phylum ci that's just a catch-all entry point the thing that gets exposed through our docker container to handle almost all of our integrations um you know so if you want to monitor your prs on github for instance um you know we've got an integration for that nice so it. the idea is basically that i could set this up in github a pr comes in i could set up an action phylum will scan it for known mischievousness that's right and and make that part of the pr or maybe even block it out right yeah exactly it'll 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 fail your build if if you don't pass your you know default policy or established policy on um uh on any of your given lock files or manifests we we deal with manifests as well and you mentioned github so even with github we we went a step further we we have an app as well so you don't even have to modify a workflow you could just install a github app and uh, automatically monitor um your repositories but okay. a lot of the other ecosystems you know don't don't have that so we we just provide docker containers yeah, I, I love the docker container so you use docker <laughs> docker run uh, against your code or whatever so uh yeah uh, and, and then uh, get, uh there's even a a, a pre-commit hook uh, we expose as well, nice. so you can nice i genuinely don't genuinely don't know the answer to this question does this cost money no um we have you can sign anyone anyone can sign up for free there's a, a a community edition uh where you can have up to five projects uh, okay cool you guys have to eat there must be some way you charge for oh exactly yeah yeah there's so there's there's the the paid version right which you know unlimited projects you get access to Got it. you know group based management you know there's a few extra features it's a it's a yeah, freemium more, model more of a, a teams enterprisey angle yeah yeah but for this audience i mean i i would just i would love if you know everyone just went that little extra step of securing their their open source software and you know go with the free option i'm not trying to sell you anything here just <laughs> uh you know yeah. monitor your awesome. your manifest your lock files make sure that you're, you're you remain secure you're not exposing uh your secrets because that's that's what we're finding now is that developers are the new high value targets yeah um that's what attackers want to go after because we know that developers they have the secrets they've got the the keys you know the yeah. we we write the code that then gets run and on this production server inside the firewalls yeah 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 we yeah, have we have all the access <laughs> all the access all the secrets all the keys so you know if you can find a way to uh uh get arbitrary code from strangers to run on developer systems you're gonna you're gonna have a much you're better have a good time yeah. yeah you're gonna have a good yeah. time as a by that i mean having a bad time right <laughs> yeah <laughs> doing bad things okay yeah. let's not do that awesome well excellent work i think probably we kind of just leave it there we're pretty much out of time for okay. the rest of the stuff but close it out for us charlie what do you people are maybe both have a few new tools to work with but also techniques but maybe also a little freaked out what do you tell them i would recommend everyone to restrict their use of dependencies to lock files um and then carefully gate or guard the inclusion of new lock files or updates of existing ones or sorry dependencies in those lock files with careful analysis um don't allow arbitrary code to run anywhere in your development process and give phylum a try you know we've got the free community edition we will provide that analysis and ensure that you don't have malware running uh, on your system through bad dependencies mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, it's been very interesting and a lot of new things to think about. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. See you later.